I'm no good at taking good advice And I'm self-careless, so don't tell me twice That lately I've been so stuck in my head That I forget just about everything my therapist said Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe we are all self-helpless Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Self-Helpless Podcast. I'm Delaney Fisher, and today we have the wonderful Dr. Romani Dervasala on the show. Dr. Romani is a licensed clinical psychologist. You've seen her work all over the place. She's been featured at South by Southwest, TEDx, Red Table Talk, The Today Show. I feel like every time I turn on the TV, Dr. Romani is a featured expert on whatever show I'm watching. She's also the host of the podcast, Navigating Narcissism, and you can get her new book that just came out. It's called It's Not You, Identify and Healing from Narcissistic People. And this is Dr. Romani's third time on Self Helpless, and the other episodes that she has done for us, she really gave a great overview on narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. And then the other episode was about borderline personality disorder and other cluster B um, types. And, um, you know, basically what these can look like, how to identify them. She also breaks down all the lingo you've probably heard, like gaslighting and breadcrumbing, future faking. So if you want a deep dive into narcissism and NPD, BPD, then go check those episodes out um, because today's episode is about what happens after you've identified that you're in a narcissistic dynamic and you want to make changes, you want to heal. So whether that's leaving the relationship or reestablishing how you interact with the person. Um, so in this episode, Dr. Romney shares first steps that people can take health issues some some people may experience after having endured a damaging relationship like this, how long you should stay single before dating again if you've just come out of a narcissistic relationship, what co-parenting with a narcissist may look like, um, why not everyone around you may be supportive for, you know, of setting boundaries around, you know, this toxic dynamic that you've been in, the range of guilt you may experience and how that can change over time and just so much more. So please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Romani. Dr. Romani, so great to have you back on the podcast. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So you've been on the show before to help us identify narcissistic behaviors and dynamics, as well as several other personality, personality disorders, you know, what those can really look like. And today we're really honing in on what happens after identification, the boundary mm -hmm. setting and healing process and kind of protecting yourself from these mm -hmm. dynamics going forward. Before we get into all of that, what is the difference between a, like a healthy or average amount of narcissism versus like, at what point is it considered a problem or really damaging? I don't think there's any such thing as healthy narcissism, to be frank with you. I don't think there's okay. a healthy dose of it because okay. I think that narcissism by definition is antagonistic. There mm -hmm. is, there's variable empathy, there is entitlement, there is egocentricity. That's never going to be good. And I think where it gets confusing then, the reason I say that there's no such thing as healthy narcissism. Yeah. There may be times in our life selfishness is necessary. It might be that we are on the deadline of our lives. It might be that we have so many responsibilities, caregiving responsibilities in our life that we can't take on extra work in our job kind of thing, right? That might be labeled selfishness, right? But okay. in doing that, we may communicate it very clearly and say, I won't be able to take this on. It may very well be that you, you know, you, we work with people on a solution. We don't yell at them. We don't think I'm so special that I deserve special dispensation. So remember, narcissism is not just selfishness. It's not just empathy issues. It's all of it together, right? It's like saying an egg is a cake. That's not the case. An egg is an egg. An egg with many other things is a cake. And so I, I, I'm very much of the school of thought that there is not such a thing as healthy narcissism. I think there's healthy okay. assertiveness. I think there is healthy, um, self-advocacy. Mm -hmm. I think that there are, is, um, 
I think that those things can be healthy, right? right. But I don't believe that, that I think that by definition, narcissism is an antagonistic state. And I think because it brings harm at some level, or at least it devalues other people that can't, how can that be healthy? Got it. Okay. So like the us taking care of our, our needs, like, okay, I'm hungry. I need to eat. I need that food. That is just kind of necessary selfishness. It's not really tied into a little bit of and narcissism. I don't think selfishness. <laughs> right, I don't, right. You know, I don't, yeah. And it's funny. It's sort of like, you know, and I think what ends up happening is yeah. that there are people out there who might, ooh, heaven forbid, take 10 minutes for lunch and say, well, I'm just being narcissistic and eating lunch. I'm like, sweetie, you're not being narcissistic and eating lunch. You're eating lunch. You know, mm -hmm. now, if they had messed around, got to a meeting an hour late, did not account for the other people's time, felt I'm very important. They have to wait while I eat my lunch. And that's a narcissistic version of eating lunch. But the mm. idea that somebody might take 10 or 15 minutes that is accounting for other people, that they might even say, I am going to be running late. You can begin without me. That's not narcissism. And I think that that when you can, that's why I'm saying is that the, the problem is it's many strands and, and we want to bring it down to one thing. And so I, I'm always loath to that term. I know some people like it. I know some people believe in it. I happen not to be one of them because I think what it does is it also fortifies this argument where people who are experiencing narcissistic relationships, then they get pulled right back down into the rabbit hole of maybe I'm the narcissist and nothing mm. they're doing is narcissistic except maybe, maybe they took a lunch break and like, well, maybe we all have a little narcissism and maybe I'm a little narcissistic because my lunch break went 10 minutes over. I'm like, no, 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 no. That person just screamed and invalidated and gaslighted you. And you went 10 minutes long on lunch. Those are not equivalences to me. Yes. This is so, it's so interesting because this is kind of floating around out there. Like we're all a little narcissistic and all no, that. We're not. Yeah. And, and I'm so, thank you for combating that. And, you know, if somebody's like, ambitious and they're like, I want to be successful and I want to, you know, do something that doesn't have to necessarily be narcissism. It's just because yeah, no. they're pursuing their dreams. <laughs> if a person is pursuing their dreams, right. okay. And let's right. say a person says, my dreams are everything to me. My career is everything to me. So as a result, I've decided to not get into a relationship because mm -hmm. I don't want, I don't think it's right to do that to someone To I'm always mm -hmm. going to be working nights and weekends. I'm not going to be available. And that person literally makes the choice to not get in a relationship. That person's not narcissistic. And so the idea that ambition is narcissistic is a misnomer. Ambition is ambition. Now, if a person is in a relationship with someone where there is an understanding of showing up and being a good partner and listening to the other person. And they're constantly not sort of filling their roles within the relationships, which include hearing, listening, being supportive, being empathic, being compassionate in the name of their ambition. They may be both ambitious and narcissistic, mm -hmm. but the one is not a, one is not a proxy for the other. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for expanding on all that. Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody tuning in, you know, they've done their research, they know they're dealing with a narcissist and they want to remove themselves from the relationship or at least reestablish boundaries with the person, you know, if they need to keep them in their lives, what are the first steps into changing this dynamic or, or leaving completely? So I think that the issue becomes that is the, any changing of the dynamic is only going to happen on the side of the person who's experiencing the narcissist, who's experiencing, if you will, the narcissistic abuse, the narcissistic person ain't going to change. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's two approaches. Some people choose to leave a relationship and it's very difficult to end a narcissistic relationship. Narcissistic people don't like to be left. It's a, they, they feel like they've lost control of the narrative that they're in a disempowered position. Some of them may have frank attachment issues and, and abandonment gets triggered. And more often than not, when a person leaves a narcissistic person, the initial reaction by them is rage. Sometimes it's revenge. Sometimes it's victimhood. A lot of times it's manipulation. There may be attempts to get the person back. There may be attempts to make a person look bad, run a smear campaign, spread rumors, engage in post-separation abuse, stalk them, harass them, send them emails, send them texts, be nice to them, be mean to them, be nice to them, hoping they'll come back and then be mean to them when they don't. So when you open the door to a narcissistic breakup, it can get ugly. The best thing that can happen to anyone is the narcissistic person 
breaks up with you because then they're going off into whatever their future is. And everyone, it's so interesting. The feedback I get on that people are like, no, you want the upper hand. You want to be the one to end it. I'm like, not in these situations because you're going to end up spending so much time dealing with their rage and victimhood. And oftentimes you're even your pity and guilt because there'll be a lot of crocodile tears. I'm so misunderstood, blah, 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 blah. Please give me a second chance that somebody who is tenderhearted or tender-minded might say, oh, I feel terrible. And then the whole cycle starts again. So that's the, if you leave part, you just have to be prepared for whatever that fallout looks like. And you have to do everything you can to become Hoover resistant, you know, which is really understanding that Hoovering often happens. It doesn't always, it doesn't always, but if they try to suck you back in to be very aware of that, to recognize you're going to be right back where you started, they might start love bomb phase two or phase 10. And so it just feels like it's right back to the beginning and the excitement. That's one path. The other path are for the people who say, I can't leave. I'm not going to leave. I'm not ready to leave. And so they're, but they now know what they're dealing with and they know it's not going to change. And then it's always going to be harmful and uncomfortable and all these other things. And in those particular cases that the, it's, it's when I, and again, even the word boundaries is loaded in a narcissistic relationship. You yeah. can't set boundaries with them. You're setting boundaries within yourself and setting boundaries within yourself looks largely like disengaging. There's no saying I'm going to, there's new rules in this relationship and you're not going to talk to me like that said no one ever in a narcissistic relationship and expected it to work. It's yeah. never going to work. There's no setting a rule, setting a boundary. We're not doing that. And I mean, you would feel insane if you did it repeatedly. So the way I really guide folks is I tell them is the best thing you can do is disengage. And one of the tools I give clients is this idea of don't go deep. And that means don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, don't personalize, D-E-P, deep. Don't go, don't do those things. When they say something to you that you didn't do, don't defend yourself. And people say, but I'm being accused of something I didn't do. And I said, yes, that's part of gaslighting. And the worst thing you can do with a gaslighter is engage with them. And so you don't engage. When you explain yourself, you're setting yourself up for them to tell you you're wrong. And there's something, again, you're setting yourself up to be gaslighted. And so it's really completely disengaging and not personalizing is tricky, right? Because people say, this feels personal. They're attacking me. I said, you just happen to be in this seat and your bad luck is that this is the person you're interacting with. Mm -hmm. But they'd be doing this to anybody in this situation. You're just yeah. one more. And so that idea of not going deep is a first step, but that requires radical acceptance that this is not going to change. And that takes people a minute. These are people they love, they care about, that you have a history with. So it's very hard to say, and they're not going to change. And I got to, I got to change this entirely, or we're just going to keep staying on this, on this toxic kind of carousel of interaction. Right. And then it kind of goes a step sort of further in the sense that you, you have to sort of, you can think of different ways of contact. We talk about all these forms of contact. Like if a person's going to leave the relationship, they may, they may not always, but they may be able to do something called no contact and no contact is just what it sounds like. You block them, you block their number, you block their, their social media. You do not answer to them. You don't respond to them. You do not answer their letters, nothing. They try to catch you on a, on a fake number. You stop answering all numbers that you don't recognize and they can't get to you. That's no contact. Now it's not always possible. If you're co-parenting and you have kids, you cannot go no contact. If this is a family member embedded in a larger family system, it might be harder to go no contact. I mean, no contact is scorched earth and it usually only works in relationships that have lasted a shorter period of time or relationships where there's not a lot of collaterals around you, like no kids, no extended family, no other people where there's going to be another conduit to them, right? Now, does no contact work? Sure. If I took a sledgehammer and smashed a mosquito, I'm going to kill the mosquito, but I'm also going to take a lot of other stuff out. And it, I may not always have a sledgehammer. Yeah. And so- it is a, it's an extreme tactic and some people will do it for a few years. And then if the narcissistic person shows up again, people will say, oh, I feel healed. It's okay. I'm, I, I, I don't need this anymore. I don't want to talk to them. And it's a lot easier then for people to do another communication techniques. And, and this one could work. This next technique can work even if you have to stay in the relationship and it's called gray rocking. 
Mm. And gray rocking is just what it sounds like. You become as dull, uninteresting, and inert as a gray rock. So you're you're boring. Your hope is that they're no longer going to be interested in you, that they're not going to want to engage with you, and hopefully they'll leave. But gray rocking is a lot of brief, one word, almost emotionless responses. Gray rock is tricky in person. It works really well in written communication, like texts and emails, because you really just stick to the facts. They'll they'll send you a whole gobbledygook thing and you'll figure out what the question is. And it might be a yes or no. And you'll say yes or mm -hmm. no. Or, I don't think that's I don't think so. Or whatever the correct answer is or green or purple or on the counter or that kind of thing. You don't get into the rest of it with them. In person, it's trickier because when a person's gray rock, they sometimes they themselves might seem antagonistic because it almost feels passive aggressive to some people. It's not. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But it gets interpreted that way. So Tina Swithin, who's a real a big advocate in the world of sort of especially narcissistic um, around custody and family law, she devised a term of, of yellow rock. And yellow rock rocking is similar to gray rock. You you still don't you do a lot of disengagement. You're not communicating a lot, but you are there is a little more emotion in your response. You're like, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on the counter. So you don't, so to other people on the outside looking in, especially in, in Tina's consultation work, it was often around like kids. Kids would be a little put off by like the yes, no on the counter. That can be unsettling for kids and it can be viewed as antagonistic by the courts, mediators, custody evaluators. Yellow rock oh. is you answer the question. No one can dispute that you didn't answer the question. You, like I said, you don't get into all the gobbledygook, yeah. but you do answer the question and you do it with enough like, yeah, that it's not, yes. And so, but the narcissistic person wants you to give them gobbledygook so they can get into the whole gaslighted thing with you. There's also something that is called firewalling and firewalling is basically, you're very guarded about the information you give to them and you are very aware of what they're trying to pull out of you. So an example of, and it's called firewalling, it's just like the passwords and the virus protection on our computer, it just protects yeah. us from stuff coming in and stuff going out. And so a, it's some of the techniques that even would fall under firewalling is, or are, that you don't share good news with a narcissistic person. You always, I always tell everyone, have a list of your good news people. One, two, five, 10 people that when you get good news, <clears throat> I don't know, a promotion or you get a cool opportunity or whatever good news that can, comes into your life, the mistake most people make, they take it right to the narcissistic person. Maybe it's a fawn response and they think they'll win them over. Maybe they think that they'll be proud of them. Maybe they think they'll, I don't know what it is, but people make yeah. that. They'll say it's my partner. I think that's where you're supposed to go with this stuff. And I always say, you need your good people list. You go to those people first. Those people will say, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy for you. Let's celebrate. Because more often than not, when you tell a narcissistic person your good news, they'll be competitive with it. They'll, they'll invalidate it. They will make fun of it. They will trivialize it and it ruins it. Mm. You may not enjoy it at all. If you find those people to share it with that are good, kind people who love you, you get all that joy. And then someday, if you ever choose to tell the narcissistic person, and you may or may not, the, whatever mean thing they say, you're like, whatever, I, I, I'm happy, but you had your happy with it. The mm -hmm. second thing is don't share bad news with them because your bad news is an inconvenience to them. They can't be bothered. And the bad news could ever be everything from the car has a flat tire. Ah, what did you drive over? What's your problem? To really catastrophic bad news, such as maybe you've experienced a loss or even worse, maybe you've gotten a medical diagnosis that's unsettling. The medical diagnosis is a particularly interesting and, and, and sort of painful sort of situation here because what ends up happening is a person logically so, would want to go tell the people closest in their lives that maybe they got some bad medical news. They found out that they have cancer or they have some other illness that's going to require significant protracted treatment or may even be a threat to their health. Right. Well, with a narcissistic person, when you say that, the first thing they're going to do is think of it, how, how is this going to inconvenience me, right? They may honestly be scared for you, but because they can't be vulnerable, they will attack you. It's almost like, how dare you made me feel vulnerable? So they'll say, I, I worked with someone once who said to me, I found out I had stage two cancer, terrified, went to tell my husband first thing. And the first thing out of this woman's, out of her husband's mouth was, 
oh God. So now I got to turn my schedule around to take you to doctor's appointments. Right. So it immediately went to how is it going to inconvenience him? How long is this going to last? What is this three months? Ugh. You know, it, it'd be the kind wow. of thing, do we have to reschedule this vacation? I was supposed to go fishing next month. Like they will make it about them. Wow. Same thing. I think the most painful part of radical acceptance is not just that they won't change and all this other stuff. It's that they will not be there for you when the bad things happen. So a lot of people say, okay, yes, it's not always easy. But when I get sick, I have someone who will take care of me. Not so quick. So you need the same way of that good list good, good things list of people. You need the bad things list of people. And they're probably often the same people. And you may have to find your own rides to chemotherapy or to the doctor's offices, or you may just need to call the towing service for your car and you figure out the workarounds. And it gets very, very interesting here because the narcissistic person almost likes the power to be able to say, oh gosh, I'm so inconvenienced. I have to take you to the doctor. But if you make your own arrangements, which is what I highly recommend for people, especially arrangements with someone who makes you smile or cheers you up or lifts you up, and they say, hey, I thought you had an appointment today. And you say, yeah, Mary's taking me. And they'll say, well, what's that about? Like, why are we having Mary take it to hell? Like, why aren't you having me do it? They feel left out. But if you'd asked them to do it, they would have given you a hard time. So you're always oh, in this sort of double bind. Lose, so the lose. best thing you can yeah. say, listen, I know how busy you are. And I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to bother you with this. Mary, Mary, Mary has the time to sort of sit there and chat with me when I'm having the treatment done. But they will, they will experience that as an ego injury because narcissistic people think of themselves as empathic, great people. So their schema is that I'm a great person who would go to chemo with you, but this is after you've made my chemo sound like an inconvenience, right? And so for to find those workarounds is a big part of radical acceptance. Like, who can I turn to? Who can I rely on? People will say over time, like, well, if other people are helping me through my hard times and I can't tell them good things, what am I supposed to talk about? I say in different stuff, talk about the weather, you know, talk about um, they're opening up a new diner down the street. Talk about how they close the road for two hours. And people then will say to me, well, that's not really a relationship. I said, it never was. Radical mm-hmm. acceptance is putting a bright, hot light on it and really showing you what this relationship is about. Oh, wow. I mean, what 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 is it about someone with, who is narcissistic that makes them unwilling or incapable of being vulnerable? What's going on there? It's the, it's so, uh, the, they're under, underlying all those grandiose defenses, grandiosity, lack of empathy, entitlement, arrogance, the need for validation, the need for admiration, superficiality, vanity, all the stuff, the narcissistic stuff. Those are all defensive structures that allow the narcissistic person to maintain a sense of self that is perfect. I'm perfect. I'm great. I'm better than everyone else, right? But they don't really believe it. The thing is where they don't really believe it is entirely unprocessed and unconscious. And if you, the only way I can view, say is like, imagine like a steam, steam coming out of the road or like a water main breaking and they have to cap it, right? They have to put something down on it. Mm-hmm. All those defenses are the cap, but every so often some of the pressure gets too much and it cracks open the vulnerability, for example, of learning someone's bad news, like they're sick. And when that vulnerability comes out, I'm not perfect. I have feelings. I am, they feel shame. They really feel shame. Mm-hmm. And that shame they want to lash out. They get angry at the person who brings out that shame. So that could be the person who tells them that they're sick, or that could be the person who gives them some feedback they don't want to hear, or that could be the person that says they're not going to get their way. Well, now their perfectionism has been poked at. They're not perfect. They're not special. Things go wrong for them. And they lash out at the source of that. So it's the fear Mm. of that ickiness, but this is all unconscious for them. So whereas a healthy person could say, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. And I'm also so scared. And they might even, after they sue the person who's sick, bringing them that bad news, will maybe a day or a few days down the line say, this is, I mean, they might go to their own therapy. A healthy person might say, my abandonment stuff's coming up because my partner is sick. It's not your partner's problem. They're struggling with their illness. A healthy person through empathy thinks all that through. The narcissistic person is really running at the level of a three-year-old child who truly believes they can throw tantrums anytime they want. And when the tantrum's done, mommy's still going to love them. When you're three, that works. When you're 43, it doesn't. Yeah. Wow. 
you mentioned kind of uh, co-parenting with a narcissist, if that's a situation that needs to happen, what might that look like? Are they still trying to control the other parent or are they kind of bored with them if they've been gray rocking them? What could, what could come up with something like that? A co-parenting. So co-parenting can look a lot of different ways. I mean, I yeah. think we always have this sort of the standard trope of the the mean, controlling, emotionless, unempathic, narcissistic co-parent who makes your life so much harder and doesn't help with the kids. And is that a common variant? Sure. Mm -hmm. But there are other versions of this too. It can be the parent that runs hot and cold, that is sometimes like the parent of the year and then is completely withdrawn. And that that chewing and froing is very much the narcissistic person incapable of managing their own distress. So like when they're having a bad day, they're not able to say, I got to go in that door and be a parent, no matter how bad my day was. They they expect their kids to be along with that roller coaster ride. A narcissistic co-parent will treat some kids differently than others. If you have multiple kids, they'll have their golden child. They might have their scapegoat. They may be uninterested in the kids that aren't doing the things that they want and lavish all of their attention on the one kid who's doing basketball or whatever they want that kid to do, tennis, whatever, and put their entire focus on that kid that is what they want them to be. The narcissistic parent is sort of the, sort of the, um, the uh, caricature can be sometimes the Disneyland parent, the parent who just does fun things all the time, like, let's go make a mess and let's go to the beach. And whereas, but they won't enforce things like homework or meal times or bedtime. So it always makes the other parent seem like the heel or the problem. And, you know, especially in younger kids, it can be tricky because they can't discern it. And that same Disneyland parent, if you will, when the kids get older, they'll use money. You want a car, I'll pay your rent. Here's an apartment. And so the, 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 the game is the same, but the tactics may change because different things will matter to a kid as they get older. But really what you've got to remember about a narcissistic co-parent, a parent, honestly, is that they it's all about them. It's very much a parent-child reversal. It's very much about a preoccupation with what's happening to them, their own distress. The child is really meant to meet the parent's needs. Narcissistic co-parents may get very frustrated when kids are misbehaving. They may also do things like use the kids as accessories. So when there's a good photo op or like they'd be the parent of the year, everyone's like, whoa, that's an involved parent. But behind closed doors, they have absolutely no interest. So there's a performative nature there. So people might find that a narcissistic co-parent is deeply inconsistent. You're desperately trying to communicate through the talking parents app or my family wizard app. You're doing, you're playing by all the rules that the court set out. And they're like, can we change weekends? And can we do this? And yet, and yet they'll be the first ones to hit back and say, I am not paying for those shoelaces. So is a lot of game playing with the children uses the pawns, but it can be different in every case. The only thing that's universal is that a narcissistic person will always put themselves ahead of their own children. Mm. Can, a, can a golden child ever become the scapegoat as like a dynamic changes between like a parent child, like start off as the golden child. And then I don't know, as they age, if they start to individuate, then they become like a scapegoat situation. Does that ever change? All dynamic, all these roles can shift depending on mm -hmm. what the parents need for supply is. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, some of the roles that say a little bit more consistent are like the fixer peacekeeper kinds of roles. The kids are sort of running around trying to like make the family run or try to fix everything so it's not terrible. But the golden child definitely can become a scapegoat. And that can happen on the day that the golden child is no longer the source of supply. So let's say the golden child, the parent has lavished attention on them because of their basketball. I'm going to make a sport, soccer, sure. whatever, tennis. And the parent has just focused on them and gone to the games or matches and, you know, so proud of them. And let's work on this and let's work on that. And one day the kid says, I don't want to do, I don't want to do tennis anymore. Like it was fun. It was fine. But like, there's other things that are interesting to me. I just don't want to do this anymore. The parent will lose it because that their child's success at tennis, maybe their winning tournaments, all of that was, that was bringing um, admiration and adulation to the narcissistic parent. So it would not be unusual for that parent to become passive aggressive, withdrawn, view it as though the child is punishing them. And as a result that that child could then slowly gradually become that scapegoated child. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what kind of like health issues, I guess, might someone experience after having endured a relationship like this and how can people 
kind of begin to take care of themselves? So, you know, what we do know is about that, that unhealthy relationships carry a whole host of health risks to them. Right. So, I mean, obviously the top of that list is going to be mental health issues. And it's not unusual for people who've been through narcissistic or other sorts of emotionally abusive relationships to experience um, all kinds of mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, um, they, they they may use maladaptive coping, such as using substances, which may or may not escalate to the level of substance use disorder, but can definitely manifest as unhealthy ways of coping. There may be attempts to achieve control, maybe control over food or control over other things. So we may see some obsessive compulsive symptomatology. We might see eating disorders. So we'll see the whole, and we'll just sort of see a general sort of severe level of confusion, self blame, worry, um, rumination, regret. So that all the mental health stuff is affected. Secondarily though, this is a chronic stress and it's often a chronic unescapable stress. And when people are under that kind of chronic stress, they are going to experience all kinds of physiological issues. So their, their immune system is going to take a hit. Infl inflammatory processes are going to get kicked in throughout the body. So people might experience autoimmune illnesses. They may experience gastro gastrointestinal illnesses. There might even be cardiovascular stress, very similar to the entire literature on what happens when a person experiences relational loss. We see very similar things when a person experiences relational abuse. You know, it's also really interesting. There's all the interesting research on rejection in, in relationships um, and that the physical pain of rejection is very neurologically and it's central nervous system, I should say, similar to physical pain. If you look at Dr. Naomi Eisenberger's research at UCLA, it's the same area of the brain. So we're literally, our brain is probably experiencing all the chronic rejection of this relationship as physical pain. And wow. over time, this is a tremendous amount of wear and tear physically. I've worked with many survivors over the year so who have developed, like I said, autoimmune, that their course of their medical illnesses was far more protracted than it should have been given their history. The illnesses they got didn't make sense given their genetic history. And the kind of wear and tear, the physiological, we call the allostatic load on a body is high when a person is experiencing narcissistic relationships. So this isn't just as simple as a person just being frustrated because they're in a toxic relationship. Because right. many of these relationships last for years and years and years, the toll on the person is very real. And what happens is if a person goes into a physician's office, nobody's asking you if you're in a toxic relationship. Right. Even right. if they go into a therapist's office, a lot of therapists take umbrage at this idea of the toxic relationship. We often view people as being equally complicit in their relationships. Those rules don't apply in these relationships. Mm. So could you speak more to that like why it might be really important to seek help from a therapist or other professional that really understands narcissistic abuse and what happens to people who seek help from somebody who really doesn't get it so it, it can be tricky we you know yeah. it's not taught in graduate school it's not taught in practica what we call you know the practical training we get as therapists it's mm. not taught in internship sites it's not taught in residencies I actually have the privilege to have now launched a 36 hour program that culminates in certification for therapists who want to get trained in working on narcissistic abuse. So people who are already trained as therapists can do this 36 hours of training, take exams, do ongoing training, get trauma, uh, trauma informed training, and they'll be in a much better position to work with these clients. But that literally launched like a month ago, right? Wow, so yeah. we've really been kind of banging about without, with, you know, sort of not as much coordinated training. It has not found its way into the curriculum. So because most therapists aren't trained in this, I'll say, you know, you, it would, you would do well to at least find a therapist who is trauma informed, who is, um, who is intersectionally informed and understands power dynamics and relationships and who is also might have some working knowledge of domestic abuse. Those things can help, like having those knowledge bases can help because you, you really need someone to understand how these dynamics show up in a relationship because our temptation is to say, well, why didn't you leave? I mean, any therapist who, um, who says, why didn't you leave? There, there should be like, therapy time out for that because it's not okay to ask some of that question. We don't get to ask that question. We should know enough as therapists about trauma bonding, about 
oh, you know, how old cycles play out anew, how how relational betrayal and betrayal trauma work. Like that's that should be baseline knowledge for a therapist. So people aren't leaving. We should understand culture. We should understand economics. We should understand the practical reasons people don't leave. And so understanding all, all of that is you hear a, a client's story, but a lot of clients are, they'll actually sometimes be scolded by therapists. Well, you have no right to say they're narcissistic. You shouldn't diagnose them. First of all, narcissism is not a diagnosis. It's a personality style. And these poor clients are going in there with something that resembles the roadmap because they're self-educating and they're being chided by therapists or they're saying, well, how are you contributing? And you're not leaving. And uh, the amount of the number of clients I've worked with who have been shamed by a vast range of therapists from couples therapists to therapists who just didn't know to therapists that are pushing forgiveness at them all the time. And it's a lot of the work. Sometimes the folks who do the narcissistic abuse work is deprogramming work is to say, okay, well, let's start it again. Let's start by educating you on what this is. Let's give you a safe space. Let's start, let's start anew. It takes a while to establish trust with those clients. And I've worked with many clients who have said they were so harmed by therapists. It took us six months to even have them know that I wasn't going there, you know, that this is safe. This is okay. But it's, that's a real, it's a real problem in the field. Wow. Yeah. I can imagine how like re-traumatizing that could be. You're being invalidated mm -hmm. in your relationship and then you go to, you know, mm -hmm. seek somebody and then they're also invalidating you. Um, there's a, you have so many great videos on your YouTube channel, but there's a video Thank I you. saw recently that you had mentioned kind of the exhaustion that you can feel when you're in relationship with someone who's narcissistic. And you talked about just uh, like that they need, they require disproportionate resources can you explain what that means and why that is? Why they need so much energy and attention from other people? And why the narcissistic people do? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So remember, the narcissistic person, a relationship for them lacks what we call mutuality of regard and reciprocity. So when we are in a relationship with somebody, a healthy relationship has this thing called mutuality and reciprocity and mutuality of regard, meaning that I'm in a relationship with you. So I'm looking at you and I'm listening to you as you talk and I'm understanding that. And I'm offering, you know, I'm, I'm offering empathy or compassion or maybe problem solving with you, but more than anything, I'm valuing you, right? I'm being compassionate. I might be helping you, whatever it is. And that then comes back at us. And that becomes this, this, it's not quid pro quo. It's just a natural dance of two compassionate and empathic people. That is not how a narcissistic relationship works. A narcissistic relationship is, is a one-way street. The trucks go into the warehouse full and they come out of the warehouse empty. That's a narcissistic relationship. And the stuff on that trucks is narcissistic supply that you and everyone else is driving into that narcissistic warehouse. And so narcissistic people use people for to be their pacifiers. They use other people to regulate to get this again, this need for admiration to to sort of prop up all of these defenses going. They don't have empathy, so they're not stopping to think about how well this is really one sided. I need to check in on this person. That's not even registering for them. They also use people. They use people as their punching bags. They regulate by yelling and screaming and shouting at them. And once they do that, the narcissistic person often feels a lot better right? So they've yelled, they've screamed, they've thrown their fit, whatever. And then they've thrown their tantrum. And then afterwards, the other person's wrecked, who's been screamed at, the narcissistic person feels better. And they'll sometimes be like, oh gosh, it wasn't that big a deal. Like, let it go. All right. So I was upset. It's not that big a deal. So they gaslight the person and they never stop to check in to look at the damage that was wrought for this other person. And that cycle plays out a lot because of that punching bag cycle. So what happens is people are having to give them admiration. They're having to praise them. They're having to make sure they're okay. Narcissistic people need a lot of reassurance because they need to know everything's going to be okay. They do not tolerate uncertainty well. In fact, they tolerate uncertainty really badly. They always need to know, I'm going to win, right? It's going to be fine, right? We're going to get the deal, right? I'm going to win the election, right, right, right. And so it's this, mm -hmm. it's unrelenting for them. And so everyone's like, yeah, yeah, no, everything's going to be fine. And the people saying everything's going to be fine, they don't know if everything's going to be fine. And they're worried too, but nobody's reassuring them. 
And the other things that what other things we have to do is we have to appease them. We walk on eggshells. We don't want to tell them things they don't want to hear. So we're constantly also having to practice this sense of restraint in a narcissistic relationship. Say that, don't say that, but say that this way, but make sure they had a good day at work. But then also make sure that you don't mention that, but you can mention that. So it's this constant chess game you're playing in your head. This requires a lot of bandwidth. And so people are, it's a constant titration, like, oh, whoop, whoop, don't say that again. And uh, uh, but don't go there. And then if there's other people involved, you have to be like, oh, okay, I have to make sure the kids don't say that. And then my mother doesn't say that. And this one doesn't say that. So it's in, the, in a narcissistic family system, you see this happen all the time, is everyone's caught in that dance of making sure that nobody sets off the narcissistic person. And because of that, all the resources go to them, all the psychological resources to the detriment of the other people in these relationships who don't have time, who don't have energy. Many people will say because of a narcissistic relationship, people dropped out of school, they left jobs, they couldn't keep up with the jobs, they were not the kind of parent they wanted to be because the narcissistic person required so much. They're like a big, really noisy, tantrumy, difficult to soothe baby. Yeah. My gosh, so many. Yeah, it's like, it's a lose, lose, lose situation. It sounds like when you're dealing with somebody like that, um, you've, you've shared about like the three types of, or groups of people that you might come across or encounter when you're starting to heal from this kind of a relationship. Mm -hmm. Can you share about those groups, who they are, how, you know, how they can impact people and what they can do to respond to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one, you know, one group of people is obviously the people who've actually been through narcissistic relationships, right? Yeah. So these are people who get it. You know, you, you start talking this language and they're like, yep, got it. They know the vocabulary. They know what happens. They're very compassionate to it. They get it. All right. So that's a lovely group. Let's just put them aside for me because they're the easy group. Yeah. The other group you're going to meet are the people where this has never happened to them. And there are people out there like that. Like they've never been in a shocking. narcissistic relationship. <laughs> it feels shocking, yeah, but you know, yeah. it happens where they had parents who loved each other and the family had, you know, enough resource, like that is state, they had stability, they had safety, they, their fam their parents were encouraging, they cheered them on, they believed in them, their identities were allowed to develop, they had good relationships with their siblings, they're still a close-knit family, they had good friends, maybe they had a strong spiritual community, maybe they lived in a town where everybody liked their family, and then they got, they went to college, and they met good friends, and then they got a job, and usually this doesn't work for people who work in large workplaces. It's usually a person who takes a job sometimes in a smaller workplace and it's good. And yeah, maybe every so often there's somebody who's like a little persnickety, but it's not affecting them. And it's just good, good, good and kind of happy. And um, so they just don't get it. Mm. And it does happen. I, I Every day I will meet people who will say, I don't, I don't get this. Like, what is this? You know, now, it, the, the, this is a different group than people who are actually narcissistic, right? This yeah. is a group of people who got really, really lucky. Like they just bought the winning scratcher at the liquor store. Like they just huh. won. They got lucky. They got lucky because they got the happy, stable, securely attached family. They got to see a loving relationship. They got to have those protections. It's just luck. I mean, there's really no other way to put it. It's luck. Now the trick with this group though, there's a subset of this group that because they don't understand this may not be supportive. Mm -hmm. They'll literally be like, I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't get this. Right. And then there's another part. There's another subgroup who they will try. They'll say what you're describing sounds absolutely awful. And I'm so sorry you're going through this. So that group can kind of take two directions. Mm -hmm. Then there's the group who's been through it but it doesn't recognize it or doesn't want to recognize it, right? And so these are people who might even minimize your experience. These are often enablers. And they're people who who have emboldened and enabled the narcissistic person. They don't think this is a thing. They're like, this is just how they are. Or they had a tough childhood. Or, you know, they, they things happen on, on the way they want. And they'll come up with all these justifications with little regard for how this person is hurting other people. Obviously, then there are the narcissistic people themselves, which are, the, that's a separate group. But the problem is, is that if you've gone through it, and especially if you're in a system like a family system, right, where some people have gone through it and are completely unwilling to acknowledge it, that can be really gaslighting. 
that can really feel like we, we saw this together. You saw how they screamed. Well, I, I think we're all exaggerating, right? So you feel re-traumatized. You feel re-harmed in these cases. The people who've never been through it can often leave people who, who've actually been through narcissistic abuse and acknowledge it when they encounter those people. They'll feel a sense of shame. Many of my clients who are survivors of narcissistic abuse will say when they run into the, when they meet and they, you know, whatever, socialize or interact with people who come from these really happy families and have these really high functioning marriages, they said, I feel a sense of shame. And so I'm somehow damaged that there's something wrong with me. You know, they almost feel like I feel sinister or something. And that's something we just have to work through because it, it doesn't feel good. It's almost like being the kid who, whose clothes might be in tatters and they go into a home where they're, they're more well-resourced and your sort of lack of resources showing. And yeah. I think that that's, so it's, it's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And I, I doesn't mean, I mean, I think the people who've never been through it, but are kind to survivors, it's not their fault. They haven't been through it, but it can sometimes, I think some people say, this doesn't even sound like it would be real. And yet it's many people's reality every day. Wow. It's so surprising that somebody can go unscathed <laughs> their whole life without experiencing that type of dynamic. Oh, yeah. It's unreal. Um, there's smaller it, lives. Yeah. I mean, there's smaller lives. I don't mean that yeah. judgmentally in a smaller life. When I see smaller sure. lives, that might be from smaller towns. They may not have gone far from home. They may be, and especially yeah. if they have this big, close-knit, loving family, if that becomes sort of the universe around them right. and new people don't penetrate or the new people that come in are also that way. Yeah they sort of miss seeing it, if it will, you will, right? Because so the big family becomes the key social group for them. And they may then have the good fortune of meeting someone, excuse me, meeting someone lovely, right? Yeah. And if they don't go far from home, even their employment settings may be connected to this sort of family. So I do think when I've seen this, it's often people who have this sort of very healthy kind of universe around them. Yeah. And they don't go far, they don't wander far from it. Totally and so they're just, it's, it's less hits a target, right? They're not seeing people. They're not meeting, you know, if you, the more people you meet and the more diversified your life is, um, the more likely you're going to run into it. Just, it's a numbers game yeah. at that point. Totally makes sense for, for the enabler group. Is it hard for somebody in that group to admit that something, you know, damaging is happening because it would mean that they might have to admit that they might be in a narcissistic dynamic and they don't want to deal with that. Or could it be something that narcissistic dynamics have been so normalized to them? They don't see the, the issue with it because that's just life. You know, that's just how people like are. It could be either of those things. I think for many enablers, they are one thing that human beings don't like to do is they don't like interruptions to the status quo. Right. We are homeostatic creatures. We like things to be stable. Right. We don't want we don't like it when something comes up that makes us that changes the rules and finding out that your family system is broken or toxic or having to recognize that is often experiences, I, now I have to do something about it. Right. I may have to end the relationship. I may have to not talk to this person anymore. And people don't want to do that. Again, people want the status quo. So I think for some enablers is that they just don't want to deal. It's it's really, really. And so unfortunate, but the problem I have with that is the not the just not wanting to deal means that someone else is being harmed by this denial. One of the most healing things that can happen for a person is that the harm to them is being acknowledged. Even if the harm keeps happening, the simple act of someone recognizing that this isn't okay you know, what, how the way you're being spoken to is not okay. You are a good person. You are a whole person. Do not listen to them can make it more endurable. So if other people in the system are not willing to acknowledge it, it really magnifies. If, if we see this in, tra in tra um, uh, traumatic, tra traumatizing family systems all the time, right? That people, someone's being abused in some fashion, others in the family system don't acknowledge it and subsequently don't protect others from it many would argue that that might be as bad, if not worse than the original traumas, because that this lack of safety is multiplied by knowing that people who know what's happening are not saving me, are not rescuing me, are not helping me. Okay. So that's one version of it. I think that that second piece that one has been so heavily indoctrinated into it, 
that you can't break through. Like it's almost like a person in a cult. They really believe that all the abusive, exploitative stuff in the that's happening in the cult is in the in the name of growth or whatever their their mission is. Right. And anyone who's saying something to the contrary is out to shut down the cult or is bad or something like that. So you'll see that kind of absolute sort of, you know, conviction and unseen devotion in some enablers for sure. Definitely. That can be another way that it plays out, but the harm is the same because in either case, the enabling person is denying the pain of other people who are being harmed in that system. Mm. What, what about an instance where like, let's say someone approaches the person in their life who has NPD or narcissism and they share their concerns with them. They, they share how their behavior has hurt them. And the narcissistic individual actually responds really well to their face mm -hmm. and acts mm -hmm. like they're going to take it to heart. They apologize, which can make it very confusing to like know who you're dealing with. But behind the scenes, the narcissistic person is like behaving really differently. Uh, maybe they're speaking negatively about the person, you know, they're getting better at hiding their destructive behaviors. What the heck is going on with something like that? I would love to hear your perspective on that. So the narcissistic person is very, very driven by their public face, how they're viewed by others, right? There's a very short list of people that narcissistic people don't care how they're viewed. Usually they're people that either feel disposable to the narcissist. A great, a great example would be a senior boss and their rank and file employees. They may not care that they're the people who are running the cash registers think badly of them because they have no contact with them. So there's a there's a perceived difference or there are people in a family system they know aren't going to ever leave. They can treat them that way. They're always going to keep coming back, that kind of thing. Mm. But the, other than that though, the narcissistic person, number one, does care about their public face. Number two, they almost delusionally believe that they're good people. If you were to, on average, ask a narcissistic person, do you consider yourself an a empathic, kind person? They're like, I'm a great person. I'm a super cool person. I like help people all the time. Like I give people money. I, I donate money. Like I'm a great person. And they believe it, right? So if you're telling them something to the contrary, the what do good people do? They, they're, they're good at mirroring and emulating. They're like, okay, well, that's not okay. I better change that, right? So they're giving you the party line that you want to hear. So you will then maintain that, that sort of sense that they're a good person, right? But you've just become a threat. The fact that you've criticized them, it's, it's toast for you now. That you're on, you're on, in their, on their bad list right now. But it's the, it's all, it's very performative. It's a, it's a personality style that's very performative, right? They know, you know, for them to, to sort of give you the sort of the answer you want, it may also be management like, OK, yeah, sure. Absolutely. No, thanks for that feedback. Like, you're so right. And they will then it, in a way, it's sort of like giving that person what they want as part of a larger manipulation. They now have contempt for this person who said that this to them, but they may need for some reason to keep that person close. So there could be any number of machinations happening. But by and large, it's usually because that response is giving them what they continue to need. Wow, so interesting. Um, you mentioned, you know, that guilt can play a big role in all of this and that I, I would assume the guilt can even linger. Like if you've ended a relationship, you know that it was the right thing to do, but maybe you're just second guessing yourself. Um, what do you say to the person who still feels guilty like years later after ending a narcissistic relationship? Mm -hmm. It's interesting you ask that because what's so fascinating is that many people feel guilt or even pity in the immediate onset of breaking up. Yeah. but they don't feel it years down the road. Oh, Does that make sense? Yeah, like, I think sure. that all the crocodile tears of the narcissistic person and the victim, oh, I can't believe you're leaving me. My mother abandoned me and uh, you're abandoning me and everyone leaves me. No, I did so much for everyone. They do that whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that can sometimes keep people. So at that moment, when you continue to have contact with them, that yeah. guilt is there. But I must say that when I look at people down the road, they'll acknowledge like, yeah, at first it was hard, but gosh, I feel so much better now. Oh, like they'll right. recognize that the weight has been lifted. Like that much time had to pass the acuity of the harms, the body and the mind and all that had to kind of get a little bit more sort of calibrated. And what, after all of that happens, most people will say, yeah, that was really stressful now. I, Cause it, what's happened is now they've accumulated time to see how much less stress there is in their life without that person in it. 
Right. Oh, that's so, so I mean, to hear. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really what I see more often. I do see it in the in, in the in the immediacy and in probably even in that first 12 months, guilt may be operating, right? Or did I see it wrong? Am I getting this wrong? Maybe I'm making the wrong decision. Am I the one who's the problem? Am I the one who's cruel? Am I the one who's mean? Do I have unrealistic standards? That's the stuff that people spin through. But if they can sort of hold the course and stay on the other side. Many of them might even still say, I pity them. I still pity them. Mm -hmm. They may not feel so much guilt, but the overarching relief tends to be the primary emotion. Like this was the best thing I did. And my life is so much easier without them, without them in it. Oh, that's so good. I'm so glad people are hearing that right now. Cause I'm, I'm sure it's a tough thing to, to do in the moment and those mm -hmm. first several months and all of that. What about the people who they've identified a narcissistic, narcissistic relationship, they've left it they feel healed and then they find themselves in another narcissistic mm -hmm. relationship down the road. They they've acknowledged it, but they're in this pattern still. Maybe they're quicker mm -hmm. to recognize it, but what's going on there? So that happens all the time, right? Yeah. It happens all the time. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, and then probably the most common reason it happens is people get back into a new relationship too quickly. I always tell people, and I'm now talking about intimate relationships. I'm not talking about family relationships as much, but like you've ended one romantic intimate relationship. And I, I always tell people, please try to take at least 12 months off, at least 12 months, if not longer from dating, sex, anything, apps, yeah. you name it. If the relationship you left, the narcissistic relationship you left was less than 12 months, then sure then you can take a break for, from other people for as long as that was six months and take six months off. But 12 months or longer, if that was how long your narcissistic relationship was, give yourself that long a break. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is honestly to give your nervous system a break, your body a break, and your mind a break. You need to come back to you. You had to give up on yourself and give up a lot of what mattered to you to stay in that relationship. And we need to almost get you back online as for yourself you know, to, to understand like, what do you like? They kept telling you, you don't like, um, you don't like eggs for breakfast. You're like, I think I really like eggs for breakfast. I'm like, you got to find all that again. You got to go through a year of birthdays and holidays and all that other stuff without them, because it's so important for a person to individuate, to know who they are. So when that starts getting taken away again, you're very aware it is getting taken away. There's a different awareness that comes of it. So I'd say a nice long break between relationships becomes essential. It is so tempting to do the, the whole um, rebound relationship. But the problem is, is that you're not addressing, you're sitting, you're pulling the weed off by the top and not by the roots. And it's just going to grow back again. This is really a difficult time of sort of saying, what did this relationship do to me? What did I learn? What did I give up? How can I take myself back? Who am I? What do I stand for? What am I about? All of those things. What am I willing to endure in a relationship? What am I not willing to endure in a relationship? So at the end of that, that often that can be enough of sort of a correction, number one. Number two, if you haven't done this, and, and like some people might come out of a narcissistic relationship and not even known they were in one. So they go back and repeat the cycles again. They don't stop to think about what happened in their childhood that might have rendered them sort of vulnerable to getting stuck in this relationship. They may not have been aware of the rationalizations and justifications. They may not have done the deep dive and figured out what narcissism is. So the next time someone comes in with the love bombing and the charm and the charisma, they're like, oh, great, wonderful. I'm so, I feel so fortunate. I got found someone new after the mess I was in. I didn't think this would happen again. Mm -hmm. Like to learn that, that to, to take it very slow. I mean, one thing that narcissistic people do is they sometimes capitalize lies on speed and they go quickly. And for a lot of folks, after they get the narcissistic relationship leaves you feeling so devalued, so less than that, you almost believe no one will ever be interested again. So when someone does show interest, there's a lot of relief and that relief can really block someone from clearly seeing red flags and other problematic behavior that, that could be coming up. So it, it happens all the time, but partly it's because people don't know what it was they were leaving and they're not intentional about it. Honestly, healing done right means that people are quite a little bit more likely to actually throw back a fish that was big enough to keep. In other words, they'd be like, I don't know, I'm getting nervous. Like they they did one thing wrong. And then to which I'll be like, okay, this is within the realm of normal. Now let's keep an eye on this. If they do it again, and this feels like a pattern, you have something different here. But there can be a real temptation to almost overcorrect um, rather than undercorrect. Interesting. H have you ever come across someone who 
I don't know, maybe they feel like they made a misjudgment with going no contact with somebody and they're like doubting their decision. And Mm -hmm. like, is there any advice that you give to people for that of like, they want to try to figure it out one way or another, move on from the rumination of that decision? There's a couple of things is that, you know, that's why I'm saying no contact is such a big approach, right? It almost feels like people who are trying to be sober after an addiction, like you can't, I can't drink, I can't use, I can't drink, I can't use. So they, all they do is think about drinking and using, right? Something similar happens here, but this is a different situation. One thing I do is when I work clinically with folks, I show them grace. I say, if you slip out of your no contact, you respond to one of their messages, you get pulled back in. That's okay. There's, there's no such thing as bad data. We are going to learn from this, right? And I hate to say it, but again, because we're not talking about domestic violence here. We're really talking about narcissistic, the emotional kind of manipulative stuff. I'm not, this this is a different sort of a different focus. And I say, so you went back in, what'd you learn this time? Right. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you've got to look behind, you know, you got to look behind the door to see if the boogeyman's still there. Right. And so they, I, I, in in my book, I actually call it going into the tiger's cage that you like what's is that a cat in there is that just a little kitten or is that a tiger and (laughs) one way to find out if you're not going to believe people telling you like i think that might be a tiger and if you go in there i think you're going to die but that people say oh i don't i think it's a little cute kitty like come on let me go in there i'll say go go in there it's a tiger it's going to tear you apart if it's Mm -hmm. a kitten you got a new pet (laughs) see how it goes right right (laughs) yes yes and if it's a tiger i'm right here for you all right we'll put we'll patch you back together yeah. But then you have to learn from it. And I think that that's the, to give people permission to recognize that if they don't feel confident, interact again and see how that works out for you. Right. No, that's great. My last question, I know we have to wrap up is what does it look like to be healed from a narcissistic relationship? What does that day to day feel like for people? Mm-hmm. You know, when do they know that they're healed from it? The one thing I want to say about healing is that it's a process, right? I don't think it's a point where somebody's like, oh, I'm healed and right. everything's fine. And I believe in love again. And I trust people again. And I'm on it. I think that healing means that you, you, you start to trust who you are. So for example, it might healing would be the person who says, you know, there's a couple of good people going to be at that party and they're not good for me. I'm going to take a pass on this. I love her and I'm going to hit her up. I'm going to call her. I'm going to tell her happy birthday. And then I'm going to set up dinner with her next week. But this isn't good for me. That's healing. Healing is you're dating someone new and they're like, you know, I'm not. I Back to the cats again. I, I don't like your cat. I'm like, wow, what is all this subtitle movie movie? Oh, so smarty. Yeah, no, my subtitled movies are kind of like central to my existence. So <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. And we, right. we recognize that instead of saying, oh, I'm, I'm full of all these little weird little quirks and, and, and your kitten or your cat matters to you or how, you know, your, your self-care might be watching these foreign films and somebody's having contempt for them. This isn't your person. Don't try to, these little things happen, but within yourself, you will feel more whole. You will feel less confused. You will meaning and purpose is a big part of this. Because meaning and purpose are just simply not available to people who are in acutely narcissistic relationships. While they're going through it, again, you're spending so much time appeasing them and dealing with them and caring what they think about that meaning and purpose doesn't even feel like it's within reach. But you then, as you get out of the relationship and you are are distanced from it or disengaged from it, you give yourself permission to say, what does matter to me? What is, what are my values? Who am I? What do I stand for? And you ask yourself those questions you might actually then start orienting to things that matter to you. Even some people who stay in narcissistic relationships will say this relationship is an absolute headache in my life. I can't stand this person, but we can't afford to get divorced. So they get up, they get, they might volunteer. They may start a new career. They may go back to school. Who knows? But they say, I love all this other stuff I do. I can't stand them. They're like a big piece of furniture. I often say, it's almost like, imagine you have a living room and a tree is growing through the middle of your living room. You're like, (laughs) I can't move the tree. So we're just going to move the furniture around it. You know, something, hang, hang a few towels on it or something like that. So it's a, it's that you are giving your, your true self. You allow yourself to be separate from them that you do not derive, you do not 
expend as much bandwidth believing that the only way you can be valued or loved is by silencing yourself and only doing and being what someone else needs you to to do or be it's about being discerning it's giving yourself permission like i said meeting someone and saying i don't like how that felt in my body i really don't and i'm not doing i'm not meeting with this person again or don't think i'm going to take the job that is a huge moment for survivors when they can give themselves permission to do that the hard part though is when many survivors start to become more discerning, they sometimes face a lot of criticism or people are like, oh, come on, you're being so fussy. You're so closed off. Why are you sort of skeptical and cynical like that? And, you know, we just, it's almost like we want everyone to be like a big dumb dog who's like, you're a stranger. And and meanwhile, I'm like, no, 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 trust that. That boy, that feeling in your body is something that's gotten honed through years of abuse. Let there be some good that comes of this. And so- pay attention to the feeling and healing means you do. But I will say that it is a process. And many people have been through this will say, I still, you know, make a mistake and call myself dumb. I am, I still question myself a lot. I still blame myself a lot. I take too much responsibility for what other people go through. And it's, it's not unusual for survivors to say, I became a little bit more solitary after my narcissistic relationship. I stopped trusting people in the same way. And, but you know what? I asked them, if you are solitary, are you enjoying your own company? And a lot of them will say, you know what? It's when my nervous system can be the most calm. And that solitude becomes so important for survivors. And they'll say, I used to need to be around people a lot. I don't need that as much. And I actually consider that a win mm -hmm. as long as they're still able to maintain some healthy connections. Most people who heal will see their social network become quite a bit smaller, not in a bad way. It's like almost like you're throwing all the junk food out of your pantry and what's left is high quality, nutritious food. What's left becomes high quality, nutritious people. And so all of those things are part of healing, but it is forever a journey. These things will hurt the, um, you know, I, I always say self-doubt will forever remain a fellow traveler once you've been through narcissistic abuse and Yet when somebody's no longer in your ear saying, you're so dumb, why are you doing this? You're never going to succeed at this. You, ugh, are you kidding me? That without their physical being there, that sometimes you can say, okay, I'm going to give it a try as hard as this is. And you do, and you can talk yourself through. It's very hard to talk yourself through when someone is literally telling you no, but it's, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a retraining. It's coming back to you, but it's a process. And you start to realize that one of the metaphors I use in the book is I sort of say, you know, think of it through the lens of the hero's journey and the hero, the hero is called for a very painful journey. And that was your narcissistic relationship. And as you went through that relationship, you suffered and you fought demons and you fought battles. And there were days you didn't think you were even going to make it through. And along the way, you met people, you met fellow travelers, Maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a therapist and they walk with you part away and then they let you go and you kept going. And then when the hero's journey is done, you end up home again, but it's not the same home because you've been changed so dramatically. Mm -hmm. And and what a lot of people will say is the change in me was so traumatic that I didn't, the change in me was so dramatic that I didn't fit into my family the same way. I didn't fit into my friend groups the same way. It's as though the hero's journey means that you saw something that you couldn't unsee and it changes you. This isn't about going back to the beginning. People have been too changed by these relationships, but what you come out is so much more deep and dimensionalized and, and real. I, I love survivors of narcissistic abuse. I think they're an amazing group of people, but um, the hero's journey is about coming home transformed. And everyone who goes through this, as they go through their process, they do come out the other side transformed. And there's grief around that because some people still say there was a loss of innocence there was a loss of, I believed in family in a different way. Once upon a time, I believed in love in a different way. Once upon a time. And that survivors will say, I think about those things differently now. Wow. My gosh, so much wisdom, so many great analogies in this episode. I can't wait to re-listen it. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raman, I appreciate where, that. Can, thank you. where can people find you, your work, your new book, all that good stuff. Please order my book so you can yes. go anywhere, spread the love. Like, you know, you can. there's many places you can buy books from. Buy them at any of those places. So <laughs> go order the book, um, buy the book, go into your bookseller and get the book. Ask your local library to order the book so everybody can oh, have nice. it.
And so, um, you know, so there's a many ways you can get it and there's many ways you can, you can read it. You can get a, a Kindle version. You can get the audio book. You can also find me on YouTube. We have new content that comes out every day in my daily musings on narcissistic, um, on narcissistic relationships. You can, and narciss how narcissism works in the world. Uh, you can, if you want to do a deeper dive into healing, if you go to my website, drromany.com, we have a monthly healing program that helps mm -hmm. people who are experiencing narcissistic abuse. So we got a lot of, you know, a lot of different ways. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on all social media. So come find me, please, please get the book. Um, it's, it's everything we've said, but much more elaborated is all in there. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big thank you to Dr. Romani for being on the podcast today. Be sure to go check out her new book. Um, and before we wrap up, we have a quote that was submitted by one of our patrons, uh, our hot tip segment and an iTunes review of the episode. So today's quotable is being a little weird is just a natural side effect of being awesome. That was submitted by Aaron and it's attributed to Sue Fitzmaurice. Aaron, thank you so much for submitting that. Um, it makes me think about truly how boring everything would be if we were all the same. Like if people didn't allow their weirdness to come out and roll around a little, you know, like it would just be, what would be the point? So boring. Um, and isn't it strange that like we often encourage weirdness and individuality and all that stuff in kids growing up. And then at some point, you know, it's like as a kid, you might put, their art on the refrigerator and all that, you know, display their art and be like, oh my gosh, look what this kid made. And then, I don't know, as they get older, it's like, okay, art's not a real job. You have to be an accountant or something. You know, it's really weird how we even um, like encourage versus discourage like somebody's individuality and, and weirdness and how society has a role. Anyway, uh, thank you for sub submitting that quote. Stay weird. I love it. And okay, today's hot tip. Um, goes with a little bit of a story. So uh, on the day that Kelsey's last episode aired, um, I was actually at a taping of Taylor Taylor's new show, Taylor Tomlinson, if, if you're new here. I was at Taylor's show uh, of After Midnight. Kelsey was a panelist on the episode and I was in the audience with Cam. And it was just a one of those really weird kind of uh, days and moments for us where it was Kelsey's last episode of the podcast was airing. We're all together, you know, in the same room for this taping. And we're at the, at the taping. It's on the, uh, the studio lot where we actually recorded the very first episode of Self Helpless together as a threesome. So it was just a really strange kind of full circle moment in the sense of everybody's doing like their own thing. Um, but we're kind of at this, at, at, back at the point where a lot of this started and began. And, um, it was just so, it was just such a strange, uh, strange moment. It was super fun. And then, uh, got to go out, Cam and I went out to dinner with Kelsey and Chad after the taping. So my hot tip is that if you are in the Los Angeles area, um, you can actually get tickets for the After Midnight tapings. And I think you can just either go to After Midnight's website or Instagram or follow Taylor on Instagram and sign up to receive tickets. There was also a wonderful helpster in the audience at the taping as well um, who said hello to me I was kind of, as I was walking out. So hello. Um, it was great to see you there. And yeah, it was just a really cool time and um, just a really... Yeah, just a really strange moment. I had said on the show before that um, when we started recording Self Helpless together, we would often record on that studio lot because I was working there at the time. Um, and we would book a conference room and we would record like on my lunch break or right after work. And then we would walk around the lot and I would take Taylor and Kelsey into these different sound stages to show them the sets and everything. And we had walked around uh, together that soundstage that Taylor now tapes her show in. So it was just really cool that, you know, however many years ago, um, you know, we were in that soundstage and then cut to almost seven years later, we're in that soundstage again because Taylor has her own TV show. How wild is that, right? Uh, so anyway, check out After Midnight, go to a taping. It's super, it's, it's, it's super fun time. You'll, you'll love it. You'll really enjoy it. Uh, okay, and we're wrapping up with an iTunes review of the episode. This is from Sierra from North Dakota, and it's titled, Did We Just Become Best Friends? 
I have been listening to Self Helpless for years, and it truly feels like Delaney and Kelsey are those girlfriends that are always there for you. They share the perfect balance of practical tips and life advice mixed in with their natural comedic relief. And no matter the episode title, I'm always excited to listen. I was lucky enough to talk about business in a call with Delaney. Oh, that's awesome. As well as buy tickets to one of Kelsey's upcoming shows. Thank you both for being so open with your listeners and never toning it down. Keep being you. Sierra, thank you so much. I'm so glad we got a chance to chat. Um, and I hope you're doing well. I hope um, that, you know, that conversation was helpful to you. And um, I would love to hear how you're doing now. So feel free to, to email me an update on how things are going for you. And I'm really glad that you're going to be able to see Kelsey or you already have seen her, um, you know, at her upcoming show. Thank you for leaving this review. If you want to leave a review that gets read on the next episode of Self Helpless, you can do so by going to your Apple podcast app, clicking the stars, leaving, leaving a review and uh, I'll read it and I'll get to say hello to you. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and other goodies at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you left an iTunes review, shared this episode with a friend, or post about it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say hi. Thanks, everyone.